Sir. Sir. Thank you. Look, I, um, I don't know that I would get into advice I precisely give to Scott, but I, speaking generally, I am, on, on the issue, I am an agnostic. I'm not an agnostic on other matters, but I'm an agnostic on that. And uh, I just don't think we have got the balance right. I, uh, in, I know there are maybe overworked descriptions, but it has become a bit of a substitute religion. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And uh, that is a worry. And I mean, the, the, the benefits of something like the Iranian <coughs> mine to people who are denied affordable energy in other parts of the world are palpable and yet we never seem to hear very much about that. And I think we have put too much, um, we have provided too many incentives for renewables and it is the provision of those incentives which have reduced the economic viability of base load power sources. I think that's a, an undeniable economic factor. Well, I think there is there is a, a broad issue here, which is overwhelmingly the, in the remit of state governments. And we often hear from state governments that the federal government wants to run everything. Well, if, if there's one thing that state governments in this country have got responsibility for, that is the uh, curricula of government and, and indeed all the schools under their authority. Now, I'm always a little bit wary in this area of, of believing everything um, that is said and everything that is represented as being the norm, but to the extent to which there is uh, an attempt to uh, tip children in a certain direction in this area, that it ought to be resisted. But, but that can only happen if there's a, a will and a determination on the part of state education authorities. There are significant limits. It's very easy to say, oh, the federal government should make it a condition of, 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 of giving money to the states that you know, they, they have good curriculum. Well, that's easier said than done. Um, that probably the education minister in, in, in the very large states, indeed any state, has an enormous influence on what children are taught. And they do have to wear appropriate stand up to the education unions because the prevailing zeitgeist there is very much climate change alarmism. Hey John, um, so you mentioned about the global economy, how we've got the lowering of interest rates happening around the world at the moment. Um, my question to you is what do you foresee? Like it seems like they're going to keep cutting rates potentially. Um, for the foreseeable future. Um, what do you think is going to happen if that keeps continuing and the wheels don't turn? And my second question is, what would you do if you could kind of control policy? Well, um, my, my worry is <coughs> if, um, if, you, if you don't have any petrol left in the tank, and it's virtually all gone now, um, what can you do if you get some kind of unexpected event? I mean, we were able to cut interest rates quite heavily and quite sharply in, what, 2008, 2009? Because we had a lot of room to move. They were very high, I remember. <laughs> they were higher in Australia than in other parts of the world. And I just, you know, frankly, I, I just think the last few interest rate reductions, have, I wouldn't have done them. I really wouldn't. 
cut. And not, and not just, excuse me, not just because, you know, I'm, I'm not looking at it from a point of view of savers, I'm looking at it in, in, in terms of generic management of the economy. Well, just, it just seems like, um, the, it, what, do you think they're going to go back to quantitative easing or negative rates, or what do you think is going to happen in terms of, or is it going to be a recession? No, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not that good. I, don't, I just have a, an unease about cutting interest rates is, when they're so low now, the cutting them good. And, and I think the, some of the more recent cuts, I, I just question the wisdom of them. But I, 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 I'm just a... An individual, I'm, I'm sure of those in charge know what they're doing. Mr. Howard, you mentioned you were inspired by the peaceful protests yes. in Hong Kong. Could you see those sort of protests spreading to mainland China? Well, they might. And, and, and I, and why, I, I why think, I think there's a, there, there, there could be a glimpse of the future in what's happening. Now, I know the history of Hong Kong is different than British rule and all that. But the, 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 the truth is, the people who are demonstrating there are <clears throat> educated, middle class, predominantly young. Now, there are a growing number of educated, middle class, predominantly young Chinese. And could this be a glimpse? I don't know. Uh, you, you, when these things happen, all you can do is, is react. And you, you, I, I, I don't have a, you know, a perfect scenario. I, <clears throat> I, I didn't imagine in 1989 that Lee Pung would send the troops in. You mentioned that it's a more authoritarian country than it was a decade ago. Yeah, it is. So, given that, is it more like that? The more authoritarian you are, the harder are to protest. Yes and no. In some cases, it might mean the more authoritarian now, the more reluctant people are to protest. But I just don't know. Uh, but it is an impressive, inspiring um, development. I mean, you can't help but be inspired by it. And I, I'm impressed, but and, and, and is it a glimpse? It possibly is. Mr. Howard, um, times are good, obviously, a mining room, a mining here, but is the Australian economy too dependent on its resources industry? Well, I never think you are too dependent on something if you uh, draw strength from a natural endowment. I think it's, that's common sense. I, 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 I don't think we have over-relied. We've taken advantage of our natural strength, and so we should. And one of the things I was trying to say this morning is we shouldn't be apologetic about it. We shouldn't uh, allow the industry to be demonised. Mr. Howard, just as Nick Georgetta mentioned, there's a critical skill shortage for the mining industry. Mm. Can the government do anything to lessen that shortage of Oh, mining? governments can always do certain things, yeah. Um, collectively, state and federal. Um, I think we went through a cultural period when everybody wanted their sons and daughters to be lawyers <coughs> and accountants. Mr. Howard, the, um, and that was a huge mistake. <laughs> no, no disrespect. I mean, I. You're a lawyer yourself. I am. <laughs> very proud of it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Howard, the um, Australia's economic ties with China are far more deep, deep, far deeper now than they were in 1989. And we are, as you said, overwhelmingly reliant on that relationship now. How much more difficult would it be for the Australian government now to, to deal with? A, a harsh crackdown from China on those protests in Hong Kong? Well, it's a very challenging equation. Um, let's hope it doesn't occur, and, and you know, to the extent that quiet diplomacy can matter, um, we should urge <coughs> that nothing be done that, that uh, is, is violent or uh, unduly repressive. Um, all of these things are very challenging. I, I, don't, I don't imagine there's any kind of political silver bullet. I know, and I think the governments, uh, the last 10 years, in both sides, I think they've handled the relationship with China quite well. I, I don't have any, I didn't have any particular criticism of the Gillard government and the Rudd government in a way it handled relations with China. I, I thought they made a, 
They were a little too accommodating of the Chinese right at the beginning when it came to the quadrilateral, the trilateral security dialogue, which we at that time wanted to extend it to include India. And uh, we announced that that wasn't going to happen with a joint press conference where the Chinese foreign minister was present. I didn't think that was particularly uh, ennobling. Mr. Hart, no. just on China. Um, the rural and resources sector obviously really rely on China now as a customer. Should the businesses and should the industry be doing more to engage with China, such as languages, such as cultural exchanges? Could they be doing more? Well, I think the industry does an enormous amount. And in the end, um, it was, was cultural and language exchange, they're all very important, but in the end, uh, the, the, the economic demand, the reliability of supply, the appropriateness of the price, uh, uh, they're all far more important. Mr Howard, um, another China question. What are your views on the 99-year lease on the port of Darwin by the Chinese? Well, I thought it could have been perhaps better explained at the beginning. I understand, I mean, I understand the background of it, um, uh, but it was a fait accompli when it sort of became public, wasn't it? Should it be renegotiated? Oh, that's quite a, you know, that's, that requires a lot of very careful thought. <coughs> it's e that's the sort of easy thing you can say from opposition. <laughs> and I'm not in opposition. Okay, just one more question. What are your views on the present level of immigration into Australia? Is oh, too I think much, too little? I think there's a I think there's an argument that it's causing um, some uh, supply and other bottlenecks in some of the major population centres. I think you should always be able to adjust the immigration level up and down according to economic circumstances, and and not be accused of running some kind of xenophobic, racist agenda. When, when we first became the government in 96, we cut immigration very heavily. And we also altered the composition, shifting away from family reunion into school. <coughs> and then as time went by, it, it rose again. And towards the end, we had very heavy immigration. Now, there was nothing racially based about that. It was just common sense. Should the present level be cut? Well, it has been, hasn't it? Should it be cut more? Oh, look, that's a bit of micro fine tuning that I'm not really qualified to offer advice on. Mr. Howard, <laughs> sorry, just going back to your views on climate change and um, the impact of that on fossil fuels, what is your view on the advent of the renewable energy revolution and electric cars as Australia's future? Oh. More of a reliance on the lithium ion battery as an energy security compared to fossil fuels? I think all of those things should be determined by the operation of forces of supply and demand. I don't, I think we made a mistake in, we drove, the, forced the pace on renewables. When my government left office, so the renewable energy target was 2%. And we rejected a recommendation that it be lifted to 20%. Um, I think I don't, when it comes to things like electric cars and like that, look, by all means, if they emerge, and, and obviously a lot of the key to this lies in battery storage, um, and if we make advances on that, that's great. We're far behind the rest of the world in that sort of I'm space. I'm sorry? We're far behind the rest of the world in that sort of space with electric vehicles. I'm, 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 I'm getting quite deaf. I'm, oh, sorry, I'm just saying we're far behind the rest of the world, so if we follow the rest of the world, we we're, we're behind the rest of the world. Yeah, but does that mean the rest of the world has made sensible decisions? I think a lot of people do think yeah, that. Yeah, some people think that, yeah. Mm. Depends on, I mean, I mean you, can, you can encourage a lot of people to invest in something if you give them a big enough incentive. I mean, we have very, very heavy investment in renewables now because of the heavy incentives. Now, whether that has come at too high a price for the average consumer is is part of the debate. But I don't find in the in as I move around Australia I don't find people happy with energy prices. And to the extent that the policies we have followed have driven up energy prices through too great a reliance, too great an investment in renewables and too fast a retraction from fossil fuels. That's an issue.
Ms. Taylor, could you please expand on your, on your uh, concerns about representation in regional Australia? My concerns about it? I didn't express any concerns. Now, if somebody asked me a question, I thought I spent a lot of time pointing out, I, I didn't think there was, I don't think there's an imbalance. I think the Constitution is framed in 1900 and worked rather well. Um, I, I was being critical of the fact that in, there are too many cases now in, on both sides of politics of people going into Parliament who haven't had any real life experience in anything except politics. And Adani? Well, Adani, I, you know, I thought what I, I mean, I thought Adani, I, 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 there's nothing more I can say about it. What more can I say about it? I think the, one of the major reasons the Labor Party lost the election was that it listened to its climate change zealots in Melbourne and Sydney and ignored the views of people in uh, Central and North Queensland. I think it's obvious. Mr. Howard, what role will um, uranium have in Australia's energy future? Oh, I, I, look, I, I think that's really a matter for the government. I just think that every option should be on the table. And I demonstrated that when we were we had that Spatowski inquiry the last year I was in government. Um, we have what 38 or 40 percent of the world's easily recoverable uranium reserves, don't we? And we basically sort of. In the eyes of some people, that should be completely off the table. But how that develops, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not in favour of some artificial economic incentive for its utilisation, but uh, I don't think we should close our minds to it. Mr. Howard, can I ask you about solar islands? About what? Solar islands. Oh, yeah. What does she say? <laughs> Speak up. I, I, I am. It, it, did we what? Well, Can you interpret? Sorry. Did we get it right? Sending in our troops to Solomon Islands. We were invited to do so in a in a lawful constitutional manner, in accordance with the laws of the Solomon Islands, and we were welcomed uh, as peacekeepers, stabilisers, and friends and, and the Pigeon English description of the intervention was help and friend and it epitomised exactly what we were doing. We were helping friends and that's, I mean I had a far better reception in the Solomon Islands than I often got in Sydney. <laughs> One last question. Mr. Howard, just returning to China, um, you, you said before that the white diplomacy, hope that white diplomacy um, would stop a potential do you do you think from what you see and, and from what you see from what you read and from what you know that quiet diplomacy will have much of an impact on the current regime? Well we are about to find out. I think what is what the Chinese face now is quite an exquisite dilemma. The Chinese government can't obviously afford to ignore what's happening in Hong Kong, but if, as it may well be, it's a glimpse of the future, it makes it a very big issue. Mr. Howard, you spoke... Then, this is the last one. Last, this last is the one, last one. Yeah. You spoke... Is that bloke down there was... You've had one. Do you mind? Yeah, go on. You, you had three, Jim. Go on. Yeah. It's bloke down there. Thanks, Mr. Howard. Hey, um, do you foresee any possible uh, uh, roadblocks or... Uh, if the government goes ahead with uh, religious freedom legislation? Well, it depends what, what it is. Um, depends what it is. I think we have to be very careful about any all-embracing declaration of religious freedom, I think, in practice. Uh, <coughs> the challenges to religious freedom are limited but concerning in certain areas. The main thing is the right of religiously affiliated schools to make sure that their beliefs and doctrines are endorsed and supported by the people who work there. And I don't mean you, know, you have to require 
an excessive adherence. But if you work in a Catholic school, you should give general assent to the values and beliefs of that school, or it's a Jewish school, or or an Anglican school, and, and there's nothing unreasonable about that. And you start denigrating what is being taught, well, they're entitled to let you go. I don't think it's like if you get somebody working for a company and they start saying it's they're a mob of crooks and everything, of course you're entitled to let the person go. Once again, to question of having a perspective, I'm not sure that you solve the problem by having a, you know, a, a, some kind of Bill of Rights approach. I, I don't believe in Bills of Rights. I never have. Well, just one more one. Well, uh, will we see you in the Palace Hotel tonight? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> What's that again? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know. Mr. Howard, thank you very much. Okay, right.